Hello, everybody. This is the final ghost story in the series. Um, next week, or this week starting really, we're going to be looking at vampires. But I'm going to finish up the week with something a bit different um, because I'm going to read one of my own stories because I write ghost stories. Um, something that we talked about in class was the way in which different ghost beliefs survive and change and how we end up reflecting them but also playing with them and changing them and obviously like ghost stories have been around for so long and ghost literature has been around for so long that what's being produced now you're often playing with what's been done before and that's a little bit of what I'm doing. Um, my work tends to be not that scary. I've still got the setup though so <laughs> we'll see what you think. Um, I hope you enjoy anyway. The story is called And the Wind Cries in reference to the song, of course. Just so you know, I'm dead. I mean, it's halfway here, right? Ghost hunting's all the rage these days, but you never know. Better to be clear and give you a nasty shock. I don't know why I'm here, not really. The usual reasons, the ones in your stories anyway, they paint us as revealers of buried secrets and agents of providential forewarning or just looking for vengeance, but none of those really apply. I, mean, I was killed. I don't know why she did it, but I like to think it was love. Our parents married when we were already all but grown, but we loved each other as much as any biological sisters could. Differently, perhaps. I prefer to think that when I became ill, she couldn't bear to let me suffer. I wanted to live. I wanted to stay, but perhaps she couldn't bear that I would stay for her. And perhaps it was something else. Maybe she grudged the care or she wanted the inheritance. She spent it, certainly, but not in extravagance. She never left this house to live in richer surrounds. Our half-brother offered, I heard him. I don't know. Maybe the uncertainty is what kept me here. She stayed here in this house too, in this room even. This is where she slept. It was the bedroom before they turned it into this replica study and placed my writing desk here in their recreation. You've no idea how vexing it is to have them reconstitute your life and get it all wrong with you watching over their shoulders and not able to say a word. She mourned. I know she did. She shrank back into the house and we lived around each other, two ghosts in our own different ways, apart in the same space. I used to sit with her. I don't think she ever knew. She talked to me sometimes, but not to me, just to the air. I heard her though and answered, but my words never found their way to her. She saw me once, just once. It was the moment that she died. She saw me. And she left. I smiled, I know, but well, perhaps she read forgiveness in it. Perhaps it set her free. I don't know. We don't know more because we're dead, you know. <laughs> it was a long time ago that she left me and the, the house filled with strangers, my half nephews and nieces. They aired rooms and took down curtains and ripped up panels and floors and renovated and changed everything. So they felt like there was barely room for me with all the new air they were bringing in. But we got on well enough. They never saw me, and I got used to sitting around the corners of their lives. It gets dull being stuck in one place, you know. But there was an ever-changing scenery of sorts. I watched people grow and change like plants, and wither, and leave, and be replaced, and so on, for generations. I never learnt the knack of not loving them would have been easier. They never knew me. There have only ever been a few who could see me before you. Must be some kind of gift. There was a man who could see, I think, a husband to some great, great niece of mine. His eyes shifted away from me too consistently to be coincidence, but he didn't choose to see, and who was I to force him? I'm not the only one. I found another ghost across the way. Come, look. This window right here, where I first saw her. She was stood at an upper window. I wave because I always wave. <laughs> it amuses me. This time, though, someone waved back. 
she began making these gestures that I couldn't understand, but I was entranced by her hands as they wove through the air, drawing pictures and creating and molding and shaping whole worlds. Well, I mean, that's how it seemed to me. And I just couldn't look away. She saw my lack of comprehension and she stopped, but she began again with simple movements, short sentences repeated. She was telling me her name. I couldn't read the letters though, but she drew them with her fingers in the air and then repeated the gestures until I could, re until I could repeat them too. Mary, that was her name. I repeated her gestures and then spelt my name in the air. She taught me how to say it with my hands. She was very patient. We met each other at our windows each day after that, and she taught me how to speak with my hands. I watched hers fascinated for hours, days, weeks of time, until I knew them better even than my own. Long dancing fingers with skin the colour of horse chestnuts in the late autumn. She had a seamstress's hand with pads worn on her finger ends and nails short. There was a scar from one old injury which created a seam between the thumb and index finger on her left hand. She was an excellent teacher with a smile like a spring day, which encouraged my progress like those first bright flowers of the year. It took a long time. I was not the quickest learner and my hands are stubby and uncooperative in comparison. She had need of all her patience. But in the end, we could converse for hours. It made a change from watchful silence, hearing others but never speaking. It makes you invisible even to yourself when you can't communicate a single word. We were lucky to find each other, but we were stuck on two sides of an invisible and uncrossable barrier. Who knows the rules or who designed them, but ghosts are created stuck haunting a specific place. If I'm honest, I'm not sure how the place is chosen. For me, it could be the place of death or, and I think this more likely, it's the place that I can most correctly be called, it's the place that can most correctly be called home for you. Mary died somewhere else, but she was drawn back to that little upper room where she'd lived when she'd worked there. Who knows? I keep telling you that death doesn't bring knowledge with it. We spent years talking, decades. It's amazing how inventive you can be when you have endless time. And we took to reading whole books to each other, creating worlds, telling stories, matchmaking, buying in nonsensical competitions and inventing teasing quizzes. One day, I watched as her hands wove the air with a beauty that it took my breath away. They sang the air into music. I could never sing as well as her, but she taught me songs, how to map the notes with your fingers, move melody into the words with gestures, I could sit and, sit and watch her sing for hours. We had plenty to talk about as well. There were histories to discuss and secrets to share, revelations about our deaths as well as our lives. And then we were both old and we had so many changes in the world to share and try to understand. I'm older than her. The lady never tells her age, but suffice to say I'm older than half this city. Mary, she's just a young whippersnapper, a couple of centuries, nothing more. The most painful thing we did was plan. We'd come up with all these adventures we could have. We'd invite each other over, beckoning in turn, and we'd try to cross the barrier between us, but this window here was the end of, our, of my whole world, and that window there was hers, and we'd just be walking right into them, faces pushed against the barrier. We would laugh, but we weren't laughing, not really. There came a certain point where it became too much, when every word started to hurt because it was never going to be enough to reach her. You see, I loved her in the end. I loved her too much. I wanted it to be real. I wanted us not to be trapped in our own little world so near, and as the cliche goes, so very far. I started to miss days at the window. She didn't. She stayed and she watched. I would walk past, hiding in the shadows of the room and check. She didn't move from the window, but she started to leave in her own way. She grew silent. Those beautiful hands lay still and quiet in her lap. I would talk of nothing and she would watch and answer, but it was so brief that it was worse than silence. We grew distant, but not really. She still sat, like patience on a monument at her window. 
and I paced in the darkness and spoke in streams of nothing when I came to meet her, when I could stay away no longer. You living never think of us feeling. You paint us stuck in those last moments, attached to who we were and who we loved on earth. But centuries have passed. Centuries of people I have loved, like family, have lived and faded before my eyes. And I have remained alone. When you find someone who could stay, they can't come near. That's how it goes. I began to believe then that ghosts were the souls of the damned. I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe in damnation. She asked me in the, ha in the end, her hands rigid with the effort of it, lacking their usual grace. She asked me to stop pretending that I hadn't realised we couldn't ever reach each other and to let her sit at her window and watch in peace. Here she made sure I was listening, calling my attention with a half-desperate gesture and with tears running unacknowledged down her face. She said she loved me. She loved me and it hurt and she preferred we lose each other once than every day for a hundred more years. What can you do in such a circumstance but reciprocate in kind? I speak facetiously, but I never knew how to have emotions, much less tell the story of them. But so you know how it went. My eyes were half blind and my hands, for some reason, were more graceful than they've ever been before or since. I love you. I said it a dozen times. I love you and I can't bear that it doesn't matter. When we were all cried out, we shook ourselves off, shared a smile. We've both always been practical women, I feel. I reached out my hand towards her and she mirrored the gesture, reaching out to the outmost limit of our barriers, as close as we could ever get. My hand reached through the glass, through the air, through a barrier that wasn't there, and I watched hers do the same. You look surprised. Did I forget to tell you this was a love story? You can imagine. We ran into the street. We stopped short an inch from each other. We reached out tentative, disbelieving hands, and they touched, and we held hands in the street like naive teenagers learning courting for the first time. And then I was in her arms, but you don't need to know all the details. Up close, her eyes were beautiful dark pools to drown willingly in, and her lips smiled under mine, and warmed my soul like spring sun on newly unfurling flowers. Turns out, home is where the heart is. We can go wherever we please, as long as it's together. You'd think we'd be tired of each other by now, but hardly. We came back here for a visit. There's a whole world out there we've barely got started on, but it has a pull, this old place, as does hers. She shouldn't be long. We're meeting here when she's ready. Stick around. Maybe you could meet her too. Hope you enjoyed the story. Good night. <laughs>